Washington, D.C., March the 26th, 1979. In the garden of the White House, history is in the making. In the presence of U.S. President Jimmy Carter, President Anwar Sadat of Egypt, and Prime Minister Menachem Begin of Israel sign a peace treaty. The first ever between an Arab country and the state of Israel. After 30 years of the Arab-Israeli conflict, two sworn enemies make peace. Yet despite the smiles and handshakes, the treaty was controversial. It left a lot of things unresolved. Had it been possible to get a comprehensive Arab-Israeli peace agreement at the time, I would have felt 30 years later, I'm proud of what was achieved. With the bilateral treaty, Egypt recovered its land occupied by Israel. But many felt it had betrayed the Arab cause. We were trying to involve the Palestinian and the other Arab countries in the peace process because we know quite well that there will be no real peace between Egypt and Israel without the solution of the Palestinian problem. <laughs> Agreeing to peace proved a long and difficult process. A process that at times broke down over some of the region's most sensitive issues, which remain unresolved to this day. October the 6th, 1973, coinciding with the Jewish holiday of Yom Kippur, Egypt launched a lightning attack across the Suez Canal into the Sinai Peninsula. The Egyptians hoped the war would break the political deadlock in their favor. The October War was a classic case in world military history. When politics and diplomacy fail, it's normal to reinforce politics with military action in order to force the enemy to come to the negotiating table. In 1967, Israel had achieved a total victory against three Arab armies in the Six-Day War. Occupying the Egyptian Sinai, Gaza, East Jerusalem, the West Bank, and the Syrian Golan Heights. By going to war in October 1973, Egyptian President Anwar Sadat did not expect an overwhelming Egyptian victory. His aim was to seize a part of the Sinai and then seek to regain the rest of the territory through negotiations. It was clear that the, the battle would not be able to uh, restore the whole occupied territory. So there was uh, a clear understanding that you would have to go to negotiations at one time or the other. Uh, the thing that was important is to go to the negotiating table while in a position of strength, not in a position of weakness. The surprise attack gave the Egyptians an initial advantage. But after more than two weeks of fighting, Israeli forces repelled the attack, crossed the Suez Canal, and advanced into the Egyptian mainland. Egyptian forces on the eastern side of the canal were surrounded, and the Israelis were just 80 kilometers from Cairo. Sadat's attack had backfired. Egypt's position was now significantly weaker. But the war did bring the Arab-Israeli conflict to the top of the agenda for the Americans. US Secretary of State Henry Kissinger was dispatched to the region. Arriving in Egypt on November the 6th, 1973, Kissinger found a leader with whom he could do business. When he first met with Sadat, they talked about world strategy, China, Russia, global balance of power. And Sadat loved being treated like you know, a big statesman. At that point, I think for Kissinger, this was a sign. This is somebody who can get out of the souk mentality and think strategically. Embarking on shuttle diplomacy between Cairo and Tel Aviv, 
Kissinger negotiated two disengagement agreements between Egypt and Israel. As a result, the Israeli forces withdrew back across the Suez Canal to where they'd been before October 1973. On the ground, the war had changed little. I don't think Henry Kissinger wanted to resolve his resolution as such. I don't think he wanted to do that. What he was uh, interested in is to ensure that there would not be resumption of fighting. Repeat after me. I, Jimmy Carter, do solemnly swear. I, Jimmy Carter, do solemnly swear. But in 1977, Kissinger left office following the election of US President Jimmy Carter. And in the same year, elections also took place in Israel. The right-wing Likud party won a surprising victory. This represented a dramatic shift in Israeli politics. The new Israeli Prime Minister was Likud leader Menachem Begin, with uncompromising views on what he called Judea and Samaria, the biblical terms for the West Bank. What occupied territories? If you mean Judea, Samaria and the Gaza Strip, they are liberated territories. They are part, an integral part, of the land of Israel. But ironically, Sadat spotted an opportunity, thinking Israel's hardliners were the only ones who could swap land for peace. In his mind, and in everybody's mind, if Begin, the most extremist, is willing to concede, then others would not object that then others would, would also agree to go to the same way. So that decided it was time for a bold move. On November the 9th, 1977, he made a shock announcement in the Egyptian parliament. I didn't believe it. I thought it was Sadat just exaggerating. Just words or maneuvering. But going to Israel? Not possible. Especially since visiting Israel was a taboo. A meeting between an Egyptian or an Arab official and an Israeli was absolutely forbidden. We regarded it as treason. In Tel Aviv, there was also disbelief. I was shocked, and I remember myself calling my uh, chief editor. And uh, I told him what I heard, that Sadat is ready to come to Jerusalem, and he said, you are exaggerating. No, probably you didn't understand. It's not going to happen. Sadat was something of an actor. He loved to be on the world stage. He loved to have the American press, and he loved to play the roles. The people said he used to want to be an actor on the stage, and this was the biggest stage in the world. And a week after his announcement in Parliament, Sadat was offered the perfect stage. I received the telex, urgent telex, from CBS, from William Cronkite, that he wants to do a live interview combining both President Sadat and Prime Minister Begin. Would you also engage in substantive discussion? The only condition is that I want to discuss the whole situation with the 120 members of the Knesset. If uh, President Sadat would come after my return from Europe, I will come back home next Friday. <laughs> Mm -hmm. uh -huh. Shortly after the live broadcast, Sadat received an official invitation from Israel via the American ambassador in Cairo, Herman Eiltz. He said, Herman, I will go to Jerusalem. I will offer the, the Jews peace. Oh. And after that, they will have no excuses not to return our territory, to solve the refugee problem, so forth. Because what, what more do they want? <laughs> But Sadat failed to read the Israeli political map correctly. His expectation of what Israel would give in return for his offer was to prove hopelessly optimistic. Others were more critical. Just two days before Sadat's visit to Jerusalem, 
Egypt's foreign minister, Ismail Fahmi, resigned in protest. To liberation of the Arab city of, of Jerusalem. It was very difficult. It wasn't easy at all. We had been uh, spending all our career avoiding sitting with the Israelis or even shaking hands with them. And we were spending our time attacking their position and their aggression. Sadat was in need of a new foreign minister to accompany him. He selected a little-known minister. His name was Boutros Ghali. I don't hesitate because uh, as long as it is for the service of my country, I have to, to be a good soldier and accept whatever are the risk of this visit. On November the 19th, 1977, Sadat's plane left Cairo for Tel Aviv. Atmosphere was quite relaxed. Everybody was were talking as if it was done a normal trip. And the only shock we received that the distance between Cairo and Ben Gurion uh, Airport was so short. And in less than a few minutes, we discovered that we are landing. The distance between the two cities may be short, but Sadat and Begin were to find their positions were very far apart. 